welcome everyone to the uh, the November 2020 uh, Boston Limited Phoenix meeting. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guest, uh, Doc Searles. Uh, Doc? Hey, good to see all you guys. Hmm? Right, you can start the uh, your talk now. You're on mute, Doc. Yeah, we got 13 people here and let's just well, I didn't check. know I was on mute. Am I on am I off of mute now? Yes. Oh, that's interesting because I, I actually have a um a manual mute for this microphone. This my the for those of you watching on YouTube, um I have a, a microphone and, and they're the chain runs through a a, a cough button. So anyway. So I I want to talk about two things. One is identity and um, going back into the 90s, um, I had an interest in this. In fact, the, one of the people who got me interested in it was um, uh, Jeremy Miller, who um, invented Jabber, uh, J-A-B-B-E-R, which became XMPP, the standard XMPP, which was a, a chat system um, and a chat approach, which is still in the world in places. Uh, but But there's a sense for a lot of people that unless we solve identity, unless we have what some people have called an identity layer for the internet, um, a lot of things can't happen. That we need to identify ourselves online all the time. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one way or another. And I was intrigued by that. And I went to many, over the next four or five years, um, until late 2004, I ended up giving, I wrote a lot about it. I wrote in Linux Journal, I wrote in other places. Um, on my blog, which back in the in the height of blogging time, uh, the early, early the golden age of blogging, blogging, you know, I had as many as fifty thousand readers a day doing that, and uh, and I wrote a lot and said a lot about identity, and then I would give these closing keynotes to every uh, digital ID world. There was a digital ID world in that time, in which I would usually just give some kind of grief to whoever spoke because it seemed to me it was always yet another. I mean, every approach to identity was by a large company or by a, a startup wanting to be a large company that ended up with what I called large companies having safe sex with each other using customer data. And, you know, rather than each of us being able to control how we identify ourselves online and, and ended up kind of giving up on it and, and, and saying so in one of these closing keynotes. But in the meantime, I ran into a, a woman named Kalia Hamlin, um, now Kalia Young, uh, who goes by the name Identity Woman, uh, who said, well, actually, no, there's, there's a whole movement around identity that's really about everybody being really in full charge of their own identity uh, in, in their own ways, and, and basically identity management being, being fully distributed. And I said, that sounds cool. Let's look at that. And um, that, that turned into a series of conversations that kept, that kept growing until they turned into um, the Internet Identity Workshop, which meets twice a year in at the Computer History Museum, and the last two have been online, uh, like we are right now, um, otherwise known as IIW, the Internet Identity Workshop. OAuth, OpenID, a number of standards and approaches have come out of that. It's an unconference um, where there are no speakers, there are no keynotes. Everybody just comes and shares what they want to work on and everything's all breakouts. And it's, it's incredibly productive and, and very open source-ish uh, in the sense that everybody's there to share what they're working on and help each other out. So, and forgive my voice, I've been talking all day. So it's kind of toward the end of the day here. Um, and, but even there to some degree, I was, I was becoming cynical again because it seemed like are we ever going to be really in charge of ourselves online? And along came this idea um, called self-sovereign identity. I first heard of the term from a guy named Devin Lafredo, who uh, teaches hacking to kids in, on Long Island and is a really deep and good thinker, who said, basically, we are all sovereign individuals and we should be in charge of ourselves online. We're, we're in charge of how we present ourselves. And the basic idea is basically that we're in charge, but, but it was also that we should be able to present what later in the SSI movement, and it's a development movement, um, look up self-sovereign identity or that and SSI, 
and you're going to get like three, four hundred thousand results. Um, there's a lot of development going. Live streaming is starting. Okay. Live streaming is on. I see. I, they, a, a robot voice just said we're live streaming. Okay. Hi again, everybody. Um, I was talking about self-sovereign identity and uh, or SSI. Look it up; it's a thing. Um, uh, th there's a a nonprofit called uh, Sovereign.org, S-O-V-R-I-N. dot org. Dot org. Um, they're kind of at the center of the maelstrom, but there are many, many development efforts, many involving large companies as well as startups. Um, there are code bases at. Um, the, the most significant ones are at Hyperledger, which is hosted by the Linux Foundation, and Brian Bellendorf runs that one there. Brian, who's best known perhaps for his work on Apache way back when. <clears throat> uh, and uh, forgive my voice, I had a cough one sec. I'm oh, sorry about that. The, the, the idea behind SSI is that you, you, you don't have an ID you know, what we call IDs, the things we carry around in our wallets. I was going to put one out of my out of my pocket, but I'm actually wearing swim trunks because I'm in California and I'm going to go swimming after this. But if I had a wallet, you know, I'd, I'd pull out, um, you know, you want to know I'm licensed to drive and I, I have a, something that says that. You want to know I'm over 18 or in my case, 65 for some reason, I can say that. If you want to know I'm a graduate of this or if... These are called verifiable credentials. And that's really what identity ought to be. It shouldn't be, I carry an ID. It should just simply be, what do you need to know? Um, back in late 2004, when the predecessor to this movement got going, there's a, there's a fellow named Kim Cameron, who was then at Microsoft, was there for many years. Uh, uh, he came by acquisition, uh, really brilliant, and a, and a good friend as well. And Kim came up with the seven laws of identity and they're still around and they're good. And they say things like personal control and consent, limited, uh, limited disclosure for constrained use, justifiable parties, um, plurality of operators where there can be many, many participants in the ecosystem, but none of them are a feudal system that's holding you captive. And I wanted to bring up that Bruce Schneier calls this feudal security. He'd be a good guest if you haven't had him on yet. Um, he's in, he's been in Boston anyway. Um, but uh, he calls this feudal security. And and but feudal identity is in fact what I just read a few days ago. Apple and Google are both wanting to do, and Microsoft wanted to do a couple decades ago. And Kim helped stop, I believe, when he came to Microsoft. Um, the idea, and it was a part of something they called Operation Hailstorm. And um, the idea was that Microsoft would give you your ID, and that's your universal ID. You use it to log in everywhere. You trust Microsoft to be the back end for everything you do that requires identity. Apple wants to do that, and Google wants to do that. No surprise, we're using their phones. And it looks easy for them. And, and there are lots of identifiers like that that are, we're walking around with right now, which include our phones. There's an IMEI number in there, which is the identity for your phone, the actual identity for your phone. So you can be tracked. And the system is doing that right now. And we are, in the identity world right now, in some ways, we are boiling frogs. We are very boiled and we don't think about it. It's so much a part of the way that we operate in the world. So for example, you know, we want to go somewhere. We'll look at Waze or Google Maps or Apple's Maps or Microsoft's Maps app. And, um, and there are red lines and yellow lines and green lines on the roads. And you know, you know you're coming into Boston. Or, or is, it, is it better taking the Mass Pike or is it better coming in in three or two or one of the other, other routes? Or if you want to get off you know, I want to get off off the two on Lake Ave and go through, you know, uh, Arlington on your way to Mass Ave. And, you know, those are what's telling the system that there's a green line here that goes off off of two onto Lake onto Lake Street. Right. Those are those are people's phones. Those are people's phones narking on their locations through the phone system and being revealed to Google or Apple or whoever by some. B2B system that those companies have worked out. 
and we trust because we really have no choice. We never even opted into that. It just happened. This ought to not be acceptable. Um, uh, my inner Richard Stallman comes out now, right? We, we need to be in charge of who we are and, and what we allow online. And we're, our, our phone frogs are pretty fully boiled. And that's create, becoming the model for how everything else is done. In Apple's case, it's getting worse now that they're putting the same breed of chip from an, an ARM design that was in their, only in their phones now into their computers, the M1. And there's a bunch of stuff that it can do that amounts to, again, to feudal security, where your phone, even though Apple will say everything about how wonderful it is that they care about your privacy, and maybe they do, but they also care more about being in complete charge of their feudal ecosystem, where they're keeping it secure by being, by having the heavy guns up in the parapets. That's how they see it. And you're inside there, you're safe, and you're controlled. Um, and they are promised not to look at what you're doing and the rest of it. But this is, you're inside their system, you're inside their silo, you're inside their castle. So, but self-sovereign identity is an alternative to that. And it starts with all you know, what you need to know. I have a set of credentials. Those credentials are, here's my, it isn't that I, here's my diploma. It's that I'm carrying a verifiable credential that I, I graduated from Sheetrock State um, Teachers College or whatever it was, you know, and I, I have that and you can know, or the state of Massachusetts has issued me a license to drive, you know, that I have that. What more do you need to know? And in most cases, there's nothing more that needs to be known. So, and, and the way identity works in too much of the world and in the way that we defaulted to it in the industrial age, which is still with us, is that a something that in the identity world, the developer world, they call the, the identity provider, but they call them an IP and then an RP, a relying party. The identity provider is the state of Massachusetts and the relying party is the cops saying, yep, I see you've got a license. I pulled you over. You've got a license. You're the relying party. Uh, but when we we're online, you know, you're, you're using OAuth. You're logging in with, um, you know, with Google. They are the identity provider and whoever you're OAuthing into is the relying party. That is that system. What self-sovereign identity does is put you in the middle of that in a way where you're not a dependent. And that's really the key. And to me, this has been what drove my interest in Linux in the first place in 1994, which is when I became aware of it. Um, and to this day was that is the promise of independence. I don't need to have a computer that that that's inside somebody's feudal system. I can have my own. It's mine and I am in control of it. And I have valves on it that control what I, what I reveal uh, to according to Kim Cameron's seven laws that minimum disclosure for constrained use. So I'd like to point people to, to, to Hyperledger, um, to the more, they're, they're, we might call them blockchain, but they're really distributed ledgers that are there, that they're not so much there. There are code bases there, um, Hyperledger Indie, there are others, there are libraries um, uh, that if you go there, you'll see uh, that, uh, and there's just an awful lot going on in GitHub as well. Um, a lot of this is by corporate entities, um, but there's a lot going on with, with people trying to come up with the W3C, with Kentera and others that are trying to come up with standards as well that are helping build out an ecosystem. But I sort of see it right now as almost a race, one from the distributed side where we all are here on this call, I think, um, the human individual side who are, where we can do our own um, management of our own wallets that are substitutable, just like the wallets we carry in our pockets might be. Um, and we're just simply dealing with the world in a verifiable credential way. Um, and on the other end, the feudal system that Apple and Amazon, um, I'm saying Amazon and Apple and, and Google are wanting to do, but I'm sure Amazon wants to do it as well. And in fact, I heard today about um, one developer where all of the different um, instances of, of, of backup, as it were, in a blockchain 
are all on AWS. <laughs> but they're all in one contained thing on AWS, which is like, what's the point of distributing this if it's all in AWS? And and where the security that we were supposed to have with the blockchain, which is, well, geez, if these five nodes give out, we've got 40 others or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 others. Um, but if they're all inside one container, as it were, I don't even know what you'd call it because I just heard about it this morning. Um, and you stop paying your bill, the whole thing's gone. That to me is another problem with the cloud. You know, I'm, I probably have 40 loose disk drives laying around here, but they're mine. You know, I don't have to pay rent on them. And presumably if you plug them in, they're still going to work. So anyway, that's th those are really the two topics. One is what I would call distributed or independent identity, mostly called self-sovereign at this point. And and the risk of, of a feudal ecosystem where we're living entirely on platforms and we're not fully independent. And that to me is like the, at the heart of what we've been struggling with around Linux from the beginning and even go back, going back farther to, to what Richard wanted to do with the herd and, 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 and the GPL and the rest of it. So that's basically my not very well organized lecture. Any questions? I'm looking, by the way, at a lot of dark rectangles <laughs> that have letters on them. So I think anybody can speak up, I suppose. And well, now people are blinking back to life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back in tiled mode. Apparently our presentation, and that's one of one of the problems I had last time with Jitsi. Uh we had several speakers, and when a couple of speakers was speaking, like uh, Seth, you know, Bob Sun, you know, his presentation would go up, and that would go up in full screen mode on the uh, on the uh, streaming video. But when Bob did his presentation with his uh, slides, he was in tiled mode, mm. or what Bill Ricker used to call uh, Brady Bunch mode. Ah, that's a way of putting it or, or Hollywood yeah. squares mode. Yes. Uh, for those old enough to remember that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think, I think that the difference with me is that, and it's probably we were spared today is that I don't generally talk with slides. I could, but I generally don't because that requires more preparation. And, and I think it distracts sometimes from what people are saying. I often thought, well, you know, if, if Caesar and Mark Twain and Lincoln and others and Churchill could get along without slides, I probably could too, you know? So, um, I don't think that's a variable though, because Bob was talking with slides too, but it still didn't go to full screen mode. Yeah. 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 I, that was a problem. It was only with Bob's presentation. The other presentations came up on the, uh, videos full screen. It's a Jitsi issue and it's, it's well, there's Jitsi's probably a solution. And it's a work in progress, Jitsi is. And it, one thing is, on the whole, real, it real seems problem. like Jitsi is a little better every time I use it in some ways. Um, I mean, that you had a glitch with it this time is, yep. well, there it is. Um, yeah, but I thought, real problem, I thought... The real problem here is that we really don't understand why this is happening, so we don't know how to fix yeah, it. Yeah, that's well, you needed, you know. Or as they said to me when I... When I arrived at Linux Journal in '96, you know, something failed. What well, did you read? The man pages? Did you look at the bug list? You know, so uh, you know we might yeah. still be at that stage here. I'm not sure. I think part of the problems with privacy and security, well, privacy particularly, is that from my observations, about 75% of the people don't care about it. It's very complex for you know. And uh, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, John Oliver interview with Ed Snowden about, yeah, you know, so. privacy and everything. And in the end, the thing that people were most concerned with was their dick pics getting online. Right. That was it. It was brilliant. He went to Russia and asked, he said, you know, it all comes well, first he went to first he went to the United States, went to, out on the streets of New York, was talking about privacy and everything. And nobody could remember anything about Ed Snowden. But when he started talking about dick pics, they got very upset. <laughs> that the government was looking at the dick pics, not their money, not their correspondence right. or anything other than dick yeah. pics, right? It's, so, that's, a, that's a brilliant example of marketing. Um, 
what's his name, the host of the show, probably put them on that track and said, how do we actually sell this so that people care about care about the issue? Right. And that was John Oliver's point, you know, hey, Ed, I'm going to help you market this. This is about dick pics. And it's it, and, and it is. I mean, there was a really good study done in like 2015, but I don't think the conditions have changed a lot since then by um, a professor named Turo and some others at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where of what to what degree did people actually care about privacy and to what degree did they simply acquiesce to the lack of it? And it came, it came down to like everybody does actually care about their privacy. They care. They care. They care. They, but there's just they don't. They've acquiesced to a prevailing condition where they just kind of know they're screwed. And and it was complete. Their point was it was completely wrong to assume that there's some kind of deal has happened where people sacrifice their privacy for for the goodies on the web. That's 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 what marketing likes to say. You know. Oh well, you get all this free stuff because ad because of advertising, and we need to we need to spy on you to make advertising happen, and that's another one of my topics. Because I was a partner in an ad agency for twenty years, and, and advertising doesn't have to be privacy violating. That's called direct marketing. That was junk mail, and we have a now right online is really junk mail. It's not advertising. I, I think with the the gradual takeover of Silicon Valley, yeah, sort of just moving in and, and saying we're going to be in charge of identity. Uh, it's not it's not about users thinking about it and making a conscious choice and saying which one is better this one or that one uh, you know I control it versus they control it it's that it, it's the combination of the network effect of everyone else is already doing it this way and I have services working you know I the hypothetical user I have services working and they're working on Google and they're working on Apple and to go over to something that's more private that I have more control over requires effort and uh, re-education. And why would I spend the effort to not actually get more services than I have now? Right. I know it's, it's a, you know, autonomy and is an independence and all those good things that we care about are a serious value subtract for a lot of people. And, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. I, I can't use this. I can't use that. I mean, a little bit earlier, somebody was telling me, um, I mean, you may notice, okay, I'm a little bit orange looking here because I have two incandescent lights up here that are illuminating me. And they're actually very old. Um, they're antiques. And they even have the old tungsten, uh, you know, elements in them. And and they say, well, here, here are these really cool light bulbs. They're only two for $5 at Home Depot. And you can control them with Wi-Fi, and they'll change color. You can actually set the color on on your your thing, and you just tell it what the color is. Is it? What do you talk to? Oh, you talk to Alexa. I'm not going to talk to Alexa. I'm sorry. You know, I'm not going to do that. You know. So, and I know why they're two for five bucks, because they're narking on me. That's why. You know, I I don't. You know, or I at least suspect that. And so, I'll do without that. And it, you know, fortunately, that's a that's enough like gravy instead of the meat and potatoes of my life that I can live without it. But there, but for a lot of people, there are so many conveniences, you know, I mean, no, but, yeah. but one of the things is that people, I mean, I, I've been called a Luddite by some of those people because like I refuse to have those kinds of products at home. Right. right. And, um, and, and, and the thing is, it's very hard to explain to people what they don't fully understand. I mean, and you know, it's it's always hard to talk about privacy and security with with um, with you know a bunch of people because you know, like so for example, you know, one of the the typical conversation would go, well, well, I have nothing to hide, right? Um, oh, okay, um, okay, can you write down your social security number and your bank account number and put that online? And they said no. Right then, I said. Then that's why I say, like, okay, you understand that the consequences of putting those in a public place, right? You, what we don't know is what are these other things that we are putting, um, uh, uh, you know, these companies are learning about ourselves. What is the consequence, right? And you and could, what is the ruling party of fifteen years in the future going to use exactly, against you? That's being recorded exactly, now. Exactly. Right. I mean, the default we, position should be record nothing. Yeah, correct, right, and and that's the part that is very hard to get through to a lot of people because they don't they they can't understand what 
things can be done with this data, not just today, but build a profile of you over several years. And then 10 years from now, you know, when when um, they can mine all this data and, and uh, you know, do some things that, I mean, even even simple things, right? Like if, if somebody, you know, um, and, you know, at work, we are, we're, we're discussing some of the things about trusted computing and things like this. Um, and, you know, and the thing is simple thing, like, you know, we don't control what Amazon or Google or any of these companies do with this data. And maybe company as a whole has good intentions, but there's nothing stopping some rogue employee or some board person working there if, if they have the right credentials from accessing this, right? And so, so um, you know, um, that's the part that I'm not comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's very hard. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, the, 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 it's, it's a separate fact that, you know, um, now they're selling this data to third parties and, and what they do with that data is yet another question, right? It's not just these companies um, 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 uh, having our data. But um, anyway, uh, the point I was trying is that this, 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 it's very hard to explain. And then I get mocked, uh, essentially. Uh, when I bring yeah, it. well, and and I do too, and and so does my wife, who's as I was saying earlier, is is even more privacy obsessed than I am. I mean, it, if she run this call, she would never appear, you know, and because she, I think she permanently has a her the camera on her laptop taped over. Uh, it it's you know, but the, the the thing is, I mean, I I think in a in a to try to oversimplify it a little bit, just to just to bring it into relief, it really is a, a conflict. I don't want to call it a war because that's too cliched. But there really is a conflict between the need for independence and autonomy and agency um, on one hand, and 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 the need and the need for you know for convenience and security and a whole lot of other things um, for both large companies and governments on the other. And, and I think we, our community on the whole is not doing a very good job of making that clear. Uh, and, um, but I think we really, you know, part of my, my encouragement about SSI is that it looks to me like something that has a real risk of success. In other words, and and there's there's a real upside for companies to not have a pile of data about everybody. That knowing everything about everybody you come in contact with is a little bit of radon gas underneath the, your your company. It's it's the you know you're 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 liable for all this data that you're carrying when in fact you don't need most of it. If all you really really do need to know is that this person is qualified or this person went somewhere, or this person. Um, has a credential that makes life a lot easier you know it you don't have to carry you know um uh, the burden of this one of my favorite examples of of a company that that succeeded in this way is is uh is trader joe's the, the trader joe's the the uh, uh, uh the, the the grocery, grocery store, store chain so trader joe's for many years is run by a guy named doug rao is a 10, 12, 14 billion dollar company out of his house in Newton, Massachusetts. He's the president of Trader Joe's. Um, and I wrote about this in the in my book, The Intention Economy, which came out in 2012. I spoke to him about it in 2011. So it's been a while, and I, but I don't think things have changed a whole lot. Uh, he told me his job is the president of the company, which is headquartered in Monrovia, California, by the way, um, was to go to stores and talk to customers. They have no marketing. They, they don't, you know, the, what marketing they have is a float in the Rose Parade and, and an opt-in flyer. And that's beyond that. And they have a podcast. That's it. Um, they keep no records on, on customers. They don't have a loyalty program. Why don't they have that? It's overhead. It's a huge overhead for them. You know, when you go to CVS, also born in Boston, by the way, um, and you go to CVS and, and they want to know your phone number. Are you, you know, and, and, and if you don't get your, your receipt by email, you get this six foot thing that has discounts and crap you already bought and you're never going to look at. It's a, it's a lot of overhead. Um, 
in, in a similar way, you know, Pete's Coffee made shopping there harder by, you know, get an app. We want to know your name when you check in with the app and you get it out of your pocket and you put the QR code in front of the reader and it goes beep and it's crazy. You know, it's way too complicated. So there is a business reason for not doing all the surveillance, for not carrying the burden of all this data. But we're not doing a very good job of that either, in part because we're really good in our community of saying what's good for you and me. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times within countless conversations within the Linux community, one geek or another will say, here's how I do it and it works for me, do that. That's, not what, that's fine, that's great, here's what you do, but we really need to coalesce. We need to coalesce around a cause that has development in it already, which is what SSI is doing. You know, what are you doing in this where we can, you know, get some geeks together, go forth, rig up these companies so that they're accepting verify, they're putting out and accepting verifiable credentials that aren't carrying a giant namespace for everybody that they come in contact with. You know, that, so that's kind of my basic message. And I, I don't know if it's gonna work. I mean, it, you know, one of the things that I realize as I get older is that the older I get, the earlier it seems. Um, but, you know, Talk. we have seen some enormous successes, you know, like Linux. Linux is a massive success. So here we are. Doc, are you familiar with uh, SQRL? And can you say anything about how it compares to SSI? Like what problems I'm are they not. solving? Um, it, 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 SQRL is Steve Gibson's project that um, it's kind of web-centered. And I looked at trying to integrate it with SSH and I haven't figured out how yet. But uh, SQRL is basically the idea that you create a personal private key that belongs oh. on one or two devices or just one device. Right. Squirrel. And that device that device is yeah. your identity manager. And with that right. private key, whenever you encounter a new service that wants to know who you are, and that the service can only know who you are in terms of, are you the same person that came to me yesterday? You create a new private key based on a hash of the name of the service and right. your actual private key. And then the service gets a signed message based on the secondary private key. And yeah. uh, I, I may not have described that exactly right, but the idea is basically the minimum you need to return to a website as the same person is prove that you're the same person you were yesterday or that right. you're the same person is on a different device. And uh, that looks like really great because his, his uh, goal was to solve as few problems as simply as possible to, to get right. the job done. And uh, there's nothing in there about like, you can't ask an SQL client for more information. There, there's, right. it's, there's no feature for it. And uh, so how does that compare to SSI? What, what problems well, I, is SSI trying to solve? Well, it, I, I think the, the, the main problem is that you don't have to carry anything around with you. Um, actually, I realized, I mean, Squirrel has actually been around for a while and... Uh, um, it, it went live like it was, you know, frozen protocol, like maybe three or four years ago, I think, not very long ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't it was know much about it, and I, I hate to say, I actually don't know that much about it. Uh, SSI, we, a funny thing about it is that, I mean, I know a lot about it in the in, in a summary way, and I know enough about it to to proselytize it. Um, um, but the person in our family who's most involved is my wife, uh, Joyce, who's who's a figure in that in that she's not a developer herself but she works with a lot of them she's on the she's on zoom and other calls like on euro time all, every day and she's up early because we're in california you know then they're nine hours ahead eight nine hours ahead sometimes 10 or 11 hours ahead she was one on one with in russia earlier um or trying to get on one anyway but that it's um i, I it looks to me like i mean just looking back at it because i hadn't looked at squirrel in a while that it's you know I, I think it's a form of self-sovereign identity. I mean, I think it's an, yeah. ori an original model of that. And I think it's a really good, you know, um, uh, l limited but important use case. Uh, the, the, the idea in the long run is that with SSI is you should be able to go through the world getting along with the places you need to get along with without having to actually physically or even virtually pull out a credential. You're known, you know, you're going in, I'm a member of Costco. I mean, when Costco has their their side of SSI working, all you need to know when you're going in Costco is that I'm this person and I can get in there, you know, and I'm authenticated because I there's a proximity. I don't know what it would be. 
you know, it doesn't have to be biometric, but it could be. Um, I mean, so I guess in, in, yeah, in yeah, terms sorry. of credentials, the way you would do credentials in SQRL is uh, th there are no credentials involved in saying I'm the same person I was yesterday. Right. But yeah. you could optionally, the, the system would allow for once you've established, you know, I'm the guy that returned from yesterday, you're on a, yeah. a website or a service or something, you could present a credential from some other place. Mm -hmm. And then that could be used to sign your public key in the Squirrel system. And then from then on, you only need that Squirrel public key in order to to mm -hmm. be that, that credentialed person on that service. But Squirrel doesn't really care how those credentials are verified or where they come from or anything. And I guess SSI might be codifying some of that. How do you How do you take a credential from someone else and then give it to a third party and say, this is me? Yeah, I mean, I, I it's... it's I'm, what what my takeaway from this is that I need to talk squirrel with Joyce <laughs> and see <laughs> and see where where the overlap here is because I wouldn't be surprised if there are people involved in both camps, um, as it were. Um, so you know, but but technically, I mean, my joke about working at Linux Journal for all those years is that I was always the oldest and least technical editor. Um, the only code I actually know is Morse, which tells you how old I am. Um, so you know, but. I mean, I think there's a you know probably a lot to be done there. I'd be interested to see if SSI developers could actually haul Squirrel into the world. If there, if some of the maelstrom of activity going on around SSI could pull more. Squirrel I, I'm, into the I'm world. sure that there are places where it could be integrated for the function of just log in as myself. Yeah. All you need exactly. to do is store. Yeah. You just need to store a Squirrel public key somewhere for that user, and then from then on, they can log in using their Squirrel client. That's interesting because I mean, basically you're. A hash of your public key is stored on a blockchain, roughly, or a distributed ledger. They don't want to call them blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's basically the, you know, the public key side of how SSI works. But there are versions of SSI. There's a new one called Keri, K-E-R-I. I forget what it stands for, but I actually wrote about it on my blog a few days ago, a few weeks ago. That was talked about at the Internet Identity Workshop. Um, that doesn't require um, uh, a uh, distributed ledger somehow. I don't know how that is, but it's a it's a distributed ledger free approach to SSI. So I mean, and I think basically it's kind of like even like PKI is. There's a kind of architectural understanding that is forming, and I think the in an analogous way, what's happening with SSI and or even the idea of verifiable credentials is kind of like talking about PKI as public and private keys and what you could do with those. What can you do with that? You can do a lot with that. Um, it's, it's not identical by a long shot, but it's analogous in some small way that there's a, that what you, you know, and the, the sort of twist on that is that, you know, that is that you don't need, I mean, part of what we're trying to do here is wean the world from the idea that you're, ID is one that's conferred upon you by an administrative entity rather than who you really are. And who you really are as an independent actor, as a human being, what makes you human in the identity world uh, is that you can present verifiable credentials that are of use to another party. And that's it. You know, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. It's kind yeah. of... Uh, so, so squirrel, is, squirrel is definitely. I create my identity. I own my identity. Yeah, but it doesn't uh, have any verification. There's, yeah, the only verification yeah. is that I'm the same person I was yesterday. Right, but there's I'm no. A, I've there's left no a useful crumb trail yeah. that says this is. You don't need to know this again. This is what I what I who I was. And and squirrel was built for the cases where you don't need credentials. You just want to load the profile that you created yesterday. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm done, Jerry. You wanted to say something. No, actually, uh, Bob. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to ask Doc. I, you uh, are talking about maintaining sovereign identity, and that uh, this acts against uh, the companies like Google, where they have other uh, ways in which they collect identity information and they store it. I uh, they did a video a while back called I uh, called the Selfish Ledger about the kinds of uh, non-essential things they thought they would be doing with your identity by this time. And I was wondering whether you have any comments about uh, how maintaining 
I, our sovereign identity can help minimize that sort of activity. Well, I, I think, I mean, one of the problems with, I mean, every two, three, four letter acronym has its own misleadings in it. I think, um, a, to me, it's like, you know, self-sovereign, uh, the SSI uh, is less about identity. It's not about identity itself. I mean, like, I mean, you know, you, you go through the world and you want to say, who am I? I have a business card. It says this on it. I am this guy, but it's really just a role that I'm playing. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, and it, it's, you know, who I say I am. And, and, and there are these weird social things that happen. Like uh, my given name is David, but almost everybody calls me doc. It's an accident of history that that happened. I, I did something on the radio called Dr. Dave. It was a joker on the radio that I played in North Carolina 40 years ago. And, and I started a business with somebody else's name was David. And so I ended up with the nickname doc. I'm not a doctor. It doesn't matter. It, it, it's something that got attached to me. That's identity though. To me, that's identity. It's like, who are you? You want people want to know who you are. And we use the first person, the first person pronouns and second and third person pronouns but in, in ways to know who and what other people are. And that's, part of how we get along in the world. But technically, there's this thing which which we might reduce to simply just need to know. What do you need to know? And I think most businesses, most administrative systems don't need to know very much. You know, and I mean, I, I don't know much about the thing you're talking about. The, the, the uh, it's a question of what are they doing with all this non-essential yeah well and well that's another thing i mean that's part of the big mystery that's out there i mean i mean the, the big thing i've been an enemy of more vocally than anything else i've done in the last 10 years is 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 uh, tracking based advertising you know you go to smithsonian magazine you go to slate you go to um the atlantic you go to you know less than new york times now they seem to have woken up but but they do it too, to a lesser, lesser degree. The Wall Street Journal. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting hundreds, in some cases, of, of tracking files stuffed into your browser, unless you've got, you know, even if you're running Privacy Badger or, you know, Apple has its approach and Firefox has its approach, and there are any number of of tracking protection things you could stick into your browser. There's no standards, by the way, in this. There's no one way to do this. Um, and, you know, there's it's almost an iron law of technology that what can be done with technology will be done until we figure out what's wrong with it. And most dramatically, we saw what happened with nuclear power. We can blow up a city. Good. We did two of them. We're never going to do it again. We're not going to do that. Uh, Can I interject here? You, you, were at, uh, you were sort of implying there's this question of what is exactly the value proposition on the vendor side for all of this pervasive tracking. And there's a, a, some things that people have noticed that really call into question that there is a value proposition in having all that data. Um, Adam Curry is always harping on the fact that uh, very often he'll get ads for a thing that he absolutely does not want because he bought it last week. Yeah, I mean, this is a, one of the cheats that are there. So <clears throat> I don't know if Amazon's still doing this, but, you know, I, I experiment with different browsers and I experiment with different everything. And once in a while, I, I will actually leave the, leave, uh, I'll behave like a normal person would who's not running any kind of protection. And I think Adam's one of those people who's not bothering. I'm, I don't know. He's a bit technical, so he might might do it to some degree. But I was doing this when I bought something at Amazon. I had um, a JBL portable speaker that would go with a phone or a, a laptop, and uh, it died. And um, I went on Amazon, and I, I looked at the JBL I could replace that with. I looked at Consumer Reports, and Consumer Reports says, there's a Bose one that's actually better. Okay, I looked at the Bose. I bought the Bose. And, and then I went you know, now I've bought this. I am out of the market. I'm not going to buy another one. Okay. That's done. I got this little speaker. I still yeah, have exactly. it. I'm never going to buy it again. Okay. Unless that one, unless the Bose craps out, I'm not going to buy another one. I, I, it was at a time in my life, which is most of my life up until COVID started where I was traveling all the time. I, I have close to 2 million miles with United alone. You know, 
I traveled all the time. It wasn't a month that went by. I wasn't going somewhere. And, um, you know, and I'd carry this little speaker with me, handy, right? And so every commercial website I went to after that were ads for Amazon and for those two products, the JBL speaker and the Bose speaker. And I'm thinking, Amazon's a smart company. They know I bought this. Why are they advertising that to me? And a friend of mine who was in the business said, they're advertising it to you so their robot can tell JBL and Bose that an ad for their products was shown to a qualified lead. What made yeah. me a qualified lead? The fact that you showed up and looked at those things. And and it, it's all this stuff built on lies. One, one vendor it, will sell a value thing to another vendor that isn't actually valuable. It, it's actually worse. It's fraud. I mean, it really is fraud. And... and Advertising fraud, yeah. It's a, it's ad fraud, and and it's not even of the of the fraud kind where you're getting with Russian bots and the rest of that kind of thing, you know, where where most of the people looking at the ad are are robots that are just driving up, you know, what the robots operator gets paid by Google to show to a qualified lead. And Amazon's in the same tracking based business, and they're making a big profit on it. Amazon, and they can do Amazon as much is in a better position now to follow people around and advertise crap at them than Google or Facebook are because they've actually sold you stuff and they know everything you bought. There's so many fallacies though involved in this, which are not only the kind of scam that Amazon there in that case, as far as I'm concerned, it was a scam, was running on its advertisers, misleading Bose and JBL into, show, into saying that an ad showed to me, you know, and to people like me were shown to qualified leads. Um, but th there's the simple fact that we are actually not buying anything. None of us right now are buying something, as far as I know, at this moment. If you're paying attention to this conversation, you're not buying something. In fact, most of the time, we're only owning things. We're not buying them. And ownership is, in fact, a, on the Internet of Things is a far more vast greenfield for, for services. Um, there's a whole topic there I could go into that's just massive. There's some really good code laying around for this called Picos. Persistent compute objects, and I, I won't go into that, but that it's on the own side of things. But on the buying side of things, the notion that you're buying something all the time, or that you could be known that well. I mean, if 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 I go to let me just do this right now. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna add a tab, I'm gonna go to Amazon. You know, and it's gonna say, you know, recently viewed, okay, a book that I wrote, and I only went there to see so I can do a so deals on top brands, find your cozy style. All of us is for, for women's clothing, by the way. STEM toys for kids. You know, I have two grandchildren, but they're not really kids anymore. They're 10 and 13 going on 15 and 20. Um, you know, exercise equipment that I'm not interested in. A whole bunch of radios that I looked at only because I wanted the image, not because I actually own the damn radios. Stocking stuffers, you know. I mean, you know, am I a fan of the BYU Cougars? No, I'm not. That happens to be where the code I'm talking about, Picos, lives right now. A bunch of students and and professors plus some people outside of BYU. That's where that code lives. Um, but, you know, and is Amazon monitoring me right now and asking me, I'm a, make me an assumption I'm a BYU fan because of that? Or is it, I, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know what that's about. But it, it, the guesswork is terrible, actually. And you speak to people in the business and they will tell you, oh, actually, it's very good. We know that if you're shown an ad 75 times, you'll click on it the 75th time. Well, what the hell does that mean? Did I do it by mistake? Did a bot do it and not me? Have I really seen that 75 times? How do you know that? How do you know it was me? You know, I mean, and all of this is, the, the, the it's a four-dimensional shell game that's so full of misdirection that it's beyond magic. It's, 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 and, and uh, Tim Huang, HW. And there's a paper somewhere that says the scope of the money changing hands on this fraud is incredible. Oh, it's it's beyond. It, 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 somebody ought to have on is uh, Augustin Fu. He's in New York, F O U. On Twitter, he's at, at A C F O U, A C Fu. Um, he's an MIT uh, PhD, studies ad fraud, knows more about it than anybody, and, and has unpacked it. He's got a thing called uh, Page X Ray. You go, you go to just look up page x-ray and you'll see it. And it's a way to look, just put in the URL and you see 
all of the all of the trackers that are being installed. He has like a little fake version of the website that 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 goes up, and you can look at everything that's being loaded in. And it cascades through all kinds of third third parties that are looking at all this stuff, and and your attention is being auctioned live, and our RTB's real time bidding systems that know you know where uh, what's known about you is being advertised and probably you know that be you know amazon telling me am i a fan of byu i wouldn't even tell them if i was you know i mean it's 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 crazy i mean and they they ought to know more about me than anybody and the whole this whole myth that they know you better than you know yourself is just absolute 100 200 proof bullshit it's 200 proof bullshit it's it it but they're making money at it, you know, and and they'll they'll have all they'll come up with all kinds of numbers to say this is true. So I, I don't I mean, right now, I think it's falling apart. I think it's falling apart economically because the advertisers themselves, um, starting with Procter and Gamble itself, you know, Procter and Gamble yanked two hundred million dollars out of that system and found no difference whatsoever. Um, and other university, we know that uh, uh, way back in 17 did the same thing with one hundred million dollars. Um, that there was, in fact, I'll just say what it was, the University of Phoenix, you know, which does online stuff. They found that simply having ads that said, you want to get a degree, get a degree with us, work better than following people, you know, and getting the kind of people who are okay with being followed worked. And they pulled $100 million out and didn't hurt them at all, not a bit. Um, and I think we'll see, we're going to see more than that. Now, Tim Huang, who we started to mention, has this book called Subtime Attention Crisis. And he thinks that it's it very much resembles the subprime crash, uh, the future, the, the, the crash that we had in in the mortgage uh, uh, securities business in 2008 is going to happen here. I think it's going to kind of trickle away, actually. And and by the way, Facebook and Google, who everybody bring up as the primary examples of this, are going to do fine. Google makes most of its money on search advertising. Search advertising doesn't need any any of that crap. You know, you're searching for cruises. You get ads for cruises, right? It, it, you're, you're searching for radio. Yeah, search, search ads or otherwise are literally answering what you asked for. Right, exactly. I mean, they're totally intention-based. I mean, you may not want to see the ad. You may skip below the ad, you know, because, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I want to, you know, look up a mic mute. I'm looking at one of those right now or, you know, the or the light bulbs I was mentioning earlier. I could look those up. Um, Christmas ornaments. Well, you know. Show me ads for that. Fine. You know, but there's nothing, I'm not feeling like my privacy has been violated by that. Um, but I don't want to get stuck in the uncanny valley when I'm looking somewhere else and you're suddenly guessing at what you think I want. Um, I think that's an inherently broken system. But anyway, my point is that both Facebook and Google, Facebook is a completely different system, which are basically they're profiling you at all times and they're going to show you ads that the advertiser thinks categories of people with overlapping characteristics are going to want. I mean, basically on Facebook, okay, you want somebody who's, you know, you know, 25 and up that likes video games and lives in Cambridge, Mass, um, and, um, and likes bikes and, and, you know, and books and five other things. And then you're going to get ads for, you know, when the, the advertiser like pushes the, that Venn diagram on top of each other, those people fall into that. I mean, it's, you know, if you watch the movie, whatever it was, oh gosh, what is it? Came out about a month ago um, with Tristan Harris. Uh, geez, what it was? It was about surveillance and all that. But they basically made this case that they're busy building a replica of you that's a robot you and they're, you know, that's what's being advertised that. It's really not like that. It's more like, there's a long roster of things that they that their system thinks you're interested in. That's it. And and it's just matching beyond that. That's unique to Facebook. Nobody else is doing that. You know, what's happening out in the open web, which is where most of the surveillance is going on, is that a bunch of stuff that tracking beacons have found out about you because you've been traveling around with these things is being auctioned in a live marketplace. That's what's happening. That's wrong. It's a bad thing. And, but I think it's going to collapse to some degree of its own weight and of its own inefficiency. So that's sort of my take on it. 
And I'm also not sure it's the fight that I want to have. Now that Tim has written his book, it's like, okay, great. He wrote that. You know, he's an old friend. Go for it, dude. You know, same with uh, Shoshana Zuboff with her book, This Thick, which I have a blurb on the back of that's uh, uh, surveillance capitalism. It reduced to two words. Everybody knows what surveillance capitalism is now. She named it. Oh, the art, the age of surveillance capitalism. Right. That's the full name. Right. Yes. I have it on my chair over here. I'm about to read that next. <laughs> it's, uh, but I, I held I've been, up. I've this, been doing uh, the Reader's Digest version of it, uh, Mad Dog. I, I should just give you where I've gotten so far with it. Trust the data. Hold it closer so we'll see what you're talking about there. Well, uh, I have to move my fingers because oh, what yeah, I'm trying I see, to show yeah. you is right at the bottom, there's this guy oh, named hands. Alex Pentland. Who's down oh, yeah, at Sandy MIT. Pentley. Yeah. Yep, Sandy. Yeah. And he's saying, you know, what we should be doing is having is keeping our data very private and having all these advertising agencies ex, you know, make requests of us of what type of data do you want? Yeah. And then we sell it to them. And unfortunately, other people oh, say that, that on an individual basis, on an individual basis, it's worth only about twelve dollars a person, and that's not gonna buy too much attention but if you put a lot of other stuff into that you might say how much is it worth to a government to be able to get education to its people instead of sending them to a brick and mortar school how much is it worth for the government to get you know these all these things if you put it all together could you offer the person free internet if they if they went through this thing, you know, it's what we're doing now is we're taking our information and making it available to Google and Google and Amazon and stuff, and they give us free stuff, storage, you know, stuff. Mm. It's free up until you need a little bit more of it, and then you start to pay it, and it's dollar ninety nine cents a month, or two dollars a month, or five dollars a month, or whatever. But what if you could make a a, a, a business case that People could run a certain set of software and they would basically get their internet access for free. Okay. And so they would tend to. Oh, Mad Dog froze. Are you guys all there still? Yeah, we're all here. He's up in New Hampshire. Yeah, I know. He's in Amherst, and uh, I think he just got sphinctered, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it just went, the upstream went down to zip. Oh, geez. Well, I, a couple things. One is that um, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of initiatives right now that are all about selling. You it sell your personal. So, so, no, you're, but you're, you're not Mando, Mando, we lost you for about 40 seconds there. You froze uh, up. Okay. So what I'm saying is if you talk to a government and say what type of services could everybody having internet allow you to provide them and how much would you save, it might be enough to actually pay for that. And part of that would be to sell certain pieces of information to advertisers and stuff but only very specific types in a specific way. Because right now what's happening is we're sending all of our data. Yeah. If, you know, if you're using Facebook, if you're using Google, you know, if you use Google Docs, you have no control over what data goes in there. If you're storing, your, if you're storing information at Google, you have no control, and you have no control of where it went before you sent it to them. So, yeah. you know... I'm saying to a lot of people in, in like Latin America, you know, you need to have control about where your data goes because your data is actually under the control of two governments. One is Brazilian law and the other is United States law. Yeah. And it's, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Now you, you can continue. I, I'm looking something up that I want to put in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so we, we, you know, in the United States, we're very proud of our privacy laws and stuff like that. But under the Patriot Act, it just goes thrown right out the window. You know, Brazil was all upset because the NSA was reading the emails of President Dilma. 
Well, right. it's their own freaking fault because they were letting those emails go outside of Brazil, outside of their government, by using tools and stuff that the NSA could spy on. Yeah. So they need to do a better job of keeping all of that data inside of Brazil so it's only under Brazilian law, you know, and Brazilian control. And, you know, there will be some data that goes outside, but they should know what that data is. Yeah, it's all Hillary's fault. Yeah. Well, so a couple things. One is there are lots of efforts out there right now to to find the market for personal data and it, they all look to the advertising world which it it it's kind of like you know i just sort of sort of oh boy i, I don't know how to put it well, I, certain, certain types of advertising information are not bad if you're going to make a widget and you find out that the total marketplace of that widget is only a hundred units you probably are not going to make it unless the widget's really expensive, right? So that type of marketing information is not bad, okay? You know that, and and we've done it. We've done it because we used to do it through surveys and stuff like that. They're very expensive, but if one of these companies could do some deep mining and find out that there's no market for that, that's worth a lot of money to you. Yeah. So the 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 thing is that. Um... I think there's just a lot more possibility if the demand side of the marketplace has better ways of signaling supply than supply can guess at, um, which is what it's doing right now. And almost every effort in the world right now to um, get people paid for data that's being taken anyway um, is in the advertising market, is in the advertising business that's so corrupt and so broken and so... Um, I mean, truly broken, and, 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 but broken in a fully ironic way because so much money is being made in it. Um, that that is almost not worth talking about. But I think, and I actually think, to some degree, the issue really isn't data. The the, the main issue is actually personal agency, which is, you know, us having control over how we present ourselves for constrained uses on in an online world. You know, how do how do we operate as individuals in the online world with the same kind of ease that we have and the same kind of sense of security and the same kind of sense that that we're in control that we do in the physical world? You know, where we're, you know, you're walking down the street, you're not wearing a name badge, nobody knows who the hell you are unless you're a celebrity or a friend of somebody in the stores. You're not being assaulted constantly. Um, you know, that... that, that you know, we're there's a reason that Dunbar's number exists as well. You know, we're we're only built to know a, a few hundred names. There, there's a, I mean, it's sort of a separate point, but we don't need to be fully exposed to parties unknown at all times, even though that's kind of where we are right now, and we need to ratchet our way somehow back out of that. And and I don't know if we can. I really I hope we can, but I don't know if we can because if 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 there are if we end up three or five years from now with two identity systems which are Google's or Apple's and which one you're using, we have failed at our mission here and or one of our missions. Uh, but I don't. Think I agree we will. completely that that yeah. agency is a bigger issue than privacy. It, it, we should be focusing on agency. One of the yeah. biggest motivations that I had to quit Facebook it wasn't the only reason, but the biggest motivation I had to quit Facebook was. I was being inundated, um, this was probably like 2016, 2017, being inundated with messages that I didn't want to see that were from people I respected and trusted. And right. the simple yeah, solution awful. to that problem isn't, oh, Facebook should deal with this for me. The solution is allow me to create a third party client that does what I want to do with the data. Right. And Facebook was having none of that because that's not their business model. Right, right, right. Um, I, it, it's a and, and I idea. found I was much happier just getting none of it, you know, just well, cut it, it comes off down the to source. this. I mean, um, I, I have, I mean, fortunately for me, I have, um, most of I have two Facebook accounts, one's relatively inactive and it's family. And most of that family is either avoiding talking politics or, 
in rough political agreement and more or less agreeing not to talk about it. The, a couple of them are, you know, um, uh, Trump fans, but they also know well enough not to talk about it. The, the other is sort of the main Facebook feed, which is where I have a lot of relatives and old friends. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm probably older than everybody else on this call. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, I'm 73. Uh, at my way of, I mean, I've been young for a very long time. I'm older. Um, oh, good. Good for you. You, you win. That's excellent. Uh, but the, that dog's older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, my, my point with this, though, is that I have a lot of relatives and friends who are never going to be on the net anywhere but on Facebook. And I don't want to be out of touch with them. Um, you know, uh, they include, you know, my high school roommate who I've, who's life advice and everything else I value a great deal. The the problem with with him and with others, uh, some others, is that they probably every third post is about is political. I'm in agreement with all of it, but it doesn't mean. But it, but the fact that they're there, kind of, you know, I know I'm in a, a bit of an echo chamber there, but not entirely. So, most I, one of the things Facebook does extraordinarily well is, but, but Your I have streaming is on. What is this? So the thing just talked to me. But anyway, that um, there are thirteen or fourteen thousand members of that group, and most of them are old radio engineers, and and it's a club of engineers. And I've never seen an ad on it. Maybe because I have all, have all the ads blocked on Facebook. That's possible. Um, but I, I, it really feels like a private space. And and the person who administrates it, the sysadmin, as it were, or the sysop, or whatever they call it, they used to they used to call them on CompuServe. Um, a thousand years ago, you know, he's very religious about no politics. There's no politics here. As soon as you're political, you're out. And, uh, and that's blessed, you know, there, and there are at least two class, um, you know, high school and college classes that I know that meet, you know, that arrange all of their, um, reunions on Facebook. That's where but it is. In the public space on Facebook, I can't say... I accept you as a friend and I don't want to see it when you're talking about politics. Exactly. You if you had a it. third party client yeah. that was running a Bayesian filter, you could do that. Th there, there actually are some add ons that do something like that. You can, and I forget what it's called. I'm running one of them there. Um, it, it would take I, an IMAP I don't like it. I mean, back I, on Facebook. I have just huge mis I've, I'm so close to getting out of it a number of times. Um, but I, but I haven't anyway, I, I put faux fo analytics into the chat and I, and I was suggesting going to, uh, um, you know, let's see, verge.com. Because, you know, one of you posted a thing from the Verge. And it takes a minute for that, for it to set up. But I'm putting it on there. Actually, I'll put it in the chat, too. Uh, there's a, and you'll see what, you know, what following happens on the Verge. You, And one of the things that bothers me about that is that, you know, a, a magazine or, you know, a publication like The Verge will go on and on about how terrible Facebook and Google are with your privacy. And it will do a similar thing. Now, I'm not seeing it yet. Maybe it's taken a while to come up. Maybe that one didn't work. Huh. Well, it is, it is showing up in the chat window. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually looking at, at if you go to that link. Oh. Where, where does it, where does it, how does it go? So what you're looking at is what kind of tracking they do as soon as you can. Yeah, it, it visualizes the tracking. Yeah, um, I've got something that can do that too. Yeah, but you got to see this one because it's really pretty. Um, uh, let me see. Let me get. I'm actually going to copy the. And what you're saying is that the Verge keeps complaining about this, but it's kind of hypocritical. Well, you know, it's it's worse than that. Their <laughs> their um, uh, the selfish ledger. That's what it's called. Their yeah. um. Their reporters aren't really, frankly, are not allowed to talk about it. Yeah. And I've I run into this with the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. The I actually, I had lunch with with people from both of those. The yeah. Wall Street Journal case, she said, you recruited me. I got my job at the Wall Street Journal to do nothing but cover this. She got reassigned. Yeah. They don't want to cover it. They don't yeah. want to touch it. It's a third rail because yeah. that's how they make their money. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a, a pretty famous privacy-focused publication that is about the most moral publication I know, and they do it too, and they make millions on it, and they know it's bad money, and they need it. 
And it's, it's that, um, let me see, I was going to put it in here, uh, not there. I'm going to see if the selfish ledger, oh, it's the verge. I just had verge. The verge. It's the verge.com. So, uh, it's a, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing to see, to see, you know, how this system unpacks what's actually going on. There it is. Okay. It's come up. I mean, you, you can zoom in and out. I mean, there's ad server requests, 552, tracking requests, 417, other requests, 41. The time it took for all of it to download is 13,250 milliseconds, which is like 13 plus seconds to do that. Um, meaning the page doesn't fully load until all that crap gets in there and the auctions yeah. have happened at the back end. And as you zoom in on it, you see that, you know, Pubmatic is also spreading out to something called turn.com, playground.xyz, edforum.net, double click you know about. What are the rest of these on audience? You know, I mean, and that those go on out further, you know, techno rate media, acu ac acu acuity platform, hundreds of these things. There's a market out there for, for that. And they're looking at the shit that you've been carrying around in your browser. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's unreal how bad it is. And, but it's also so normal at this point, you know? Yeah. But, and, yeah. and there are ways to limit and there are ways to clean what gets in there, but they still will have it. Yeah. So here I'll, I'll put down the actual link that if you go to full analytic, no, that's not it. Is that it? No shit. Hang on a second. Uh, page. Okay. Let me copy that link, put that into the chat. Uh, Okay, there. It's fairly long, but that's what'll bring it up. And and you have to you have to wait the thirteen seconds for the whole thing to load, you know. And that's on this guy's pretty fast server, you know, that he set up only for the purpose of being a you know a headless computer that's looking to, that's being typical. That's being typical Aunt Mary who doesn't run anything prophylactic on her computer, you know what's happening to her, and it's what's happening is that and. And the Verge makes money on this, right? You know, they make money when when they can, you know, they're, a robot says a robot says a robot says that this got looked at, you know, and then all kinds of tendentious math happens at the back end for all the agencies that are doing this. And by the way, what does the Verge actually get? They may get millions, but it's like a small percentage, like between three and 30, it depends on the on what's going down, percent of what of what the advertiser spends. You know, if let's say Allbirds Shoes advertises and uses this method, you know, of the hundred dollars they spend, you know, that 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 aims toward that publication, the pub gets three to thirty percent of it. You know, not, will we know when the bubble has collapsed, and will, will we be able to say that the the line has been crossed and we can have a party tomorrow? Probably. Um, well, it, it's gonna it's gonna happen when like, all of a sudden a whole lot of companies are gonna go bankrupt. A whole lot of else. companies are gonna go belly up. A lot of them have already gone. I mean, in fact, one of my best friends in the UK had a, had one of these companies. He actually said, like in 07, he read something I wrote, started to build that so, out something, ended up inventing what was one of the, if not the biggest, real time bidding operation in the UK. He felt bad about it. He thought it was bad. He got out in early 17 and he thought the crash was coming two quarters later. It hasn't, <laughs> but he got it out. It still keeps going. It, it's like out. the housing bubble. It was like I, the housing. It's exactly like the housing bubble. And it's, yeah. but the thing is, it's not like the prices are being driven up. The stock market's like that right now, too, right? The stock market keeps going up. You know, why? Yeah. What's the, the, the real economy is tanked, you know, but the stock market's going up. It's all speculative. Yeah, I think what we as consumers of the internet will notice is that a lot of stuff starts to go behind paywalls. Well, that's already happening, right? And 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 we're seeing it too with the actual writers. I mean, there are many writers now that I would love to read, but they're, you know, um, Ben Thompson is Stratechery. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, Oh, it's uh, uh, Andrew Sullivan. There are others that are that are good, but they're you know they're going behind their own paywalls using Substack. You know, Substack's the big new one, right? Yeah. And that's a, that brings up another thing that you know, which is why should we always be on platforms? Why should I have somebody's platform that I'm utterly dependent on? That also, all of them, by the way, almost all of them have tracking. 
Because of the Visa mark- and MasterCard? Because of Visa and MasterCard? Yeah, the, the overhead of collecting and transmitting money, I, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just thinking, I mean, yeah. what they have, I mean, you look at a, um, a Substack uh, or a, a MailChimp or anybody's um, mailing list that you happen to be on and and you mouse over the link and you'll see that the URL is a paragraph long and most of that is tracking cruft. Right. And some of that's innocent. It's just saying, okay, it just says that they can count how many people clicked on this link rather than another one or looked at this one thing rather than another. That's more or less harmless, but I think there are other ways of doing that. And um, but and also, but a lot of it goes back for purposes unknown. I mean, that where you read, you know, the hosting companies, you know, stuff, and they'll say, we, their, their, their privacy policy, and they say, we're here to give you the best advertising experience, and we and our third parties are giving you the best possible advertising experience by giving you the most relevant ads, right? That means your soul has been sold to parties unknown. Yeah. That's what yeah. that says. And And when you subscribe to these things, that's what you get. Right? In, right, unless you click on nothing, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll copy the link, and I'll paste it into a browser, and then subtract off everything after the question mark, right? Because that's usually, and including the question mark, because that's usually how those URLs are composed beyond beyond the Unix path that that goes out to the last slash. There's a question mark, and then a paragraph of tracking cruft. What I usually do is when I copy the link, I only copy up to the question. Right. That's another way to do it. But it's harder to do it in email, you know, so that's. I, yeah, you sort of have to copy it into a document if you want. You to do, do that. That's what I do. I'll, I'll <laughs> copy it in an email or copy it into a, a, a text editor and then strip it off there. And probably you could do some kind of weird back row with a text editor or some, something that will recognize this as a URL and look for the question mark and take out that and everything that follows. But I've never done that, but. Right. Uh, when when I do postings that go to large groups or mailing lists, I will usually try to keep everything after the question mark out so as to yeah. make for a reasonably short URL. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I just paste in a terminal window. There's no need to open up that text here. But... In a what window? Sorry, Jabber? A terminal window. Oh, ter- oh yeah, exactly. Terminal. terminal window is a perfectly yeah. good place to do it. it exactly. Open in a terminal it. window and then just use the line editing to drop up. Yeah, for right. Mark. Just put yeah. It. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, guys, I, I am going to turn into a pumpkin when the big hand hits the six. I think. Mm-hmm. So, which I think is two hours after we started, but I'm not sure. So, what do you do with the uh, with the chat? You put it in a document somewhere. What is there? A, is that saved off somewhere? What's that? What do you do with the chat? Is that part of the um, whatever this becomes, or does this become anything? Is this yeah, recorded I've been, or? I've been taking screenshots of it as we go along, and I'm also copying it into a text file. Okay. Afterwards, I'll edit the text file and then post it on our website. Perfect. Okay, that's great. So I don't have to do anything. All right. Well, this has been great. Okay. Well, thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. I hope. Uh, the listeners, viewers, or both. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah and thank and thank you guys too. Thank this you. Is, this has been good. And uh, you know, and Mad Dog, I'd love to talk to you about whatever you're up to now. You're. <laughs> it's always good to know. <laughs> He's got that sneaky look on his face. So yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, Doc. You can hide, but you can't run. You can run, you can't hide. Hey, like that. That's probably a good one. Yeah. Uh, if you can don't worry i will i will be contacting you soon okay cool maybe okay, you should everybody. worry because i'll be contacting you soon yeah well i, I never that never worries me so it's Give me good day. okay everybody thank you so much thank you very much okay take care bye bye